Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Community Safety Decision Meeting. I am Councillor Lee Hunt, the Cabinet Member for Community Safety. So before we get going, I've got some housekeeping and safety information that I am obliged to read out. It's about fire, etc. So if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble at Queen Victoria's statue in front of the civic offices. In order to comply with the Portsmouth Cultural Trust fire marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should remember to sign out when leaving the building after today's meeting. Uh, about live web streaming, may I draw everybody's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed, filmed in other words, from a camera at a fixed location at the back of the meeting room and the recording will be on the council's website. The camera will mainly capture the backs of anyone making deputations but there will be some footage of them as they approach and leave the table where the microphones are located and of people entering or leaving the room whilst the meeting is in progress. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Uh, please can everybody remember to use the microphones uh, provided when they are speaking and if they could bring the microphones closer to their mouths because in these sorts of meetings people tend to have them over here and it's hard to hear. Okay, well thank you very much indeed everybody for your um, indulgence there. So today is Wednesday the 31st of July and we're gathered here to um, consider uh, items on the agenda which I'm going to um, very uh, uh, shortly. Um, but first of all, do I have any apologies for absence? And I don't think there are any, no, because you're both here. So uh, uh, and any declarations of interest? <clears throat> No. And before we get going, could we run around the table so everybody introduces them, perhaps we can start with you Councillor Corkery and uh, just let people know who they are and what they do. Yep, Councillor Cal Corkery, Opposition Spokesperson for Community Safety. Councillor Gemini, Opposition Spokesperson for Community Safety and Paul's Grove Ward. So I've already introduced myself. Jane Dodino, Local Democracy Officer. Good afternoon. Richard Lee, Regulated Services Manager. I'm Colette Hill, uh, Assistant Director for Neighbourhoods. Lisa Wills, Strategy and Partnership Manager for the Community Safety Team. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everybody. So uh, I've had a couple of requests to vary the order on the papers, uh, and I'm quite happy to do that. First of all, um, Bruce Marr, he'll be coming over to speak to the um, uh, item agenda three, which is the Independent Sexual Violence Advocate Funding. Uh, so he's asked me to put that back a little bit. I intend to take uh, uh, Mr. Lee, first of all, about his um, Port of Food Safety Plan. Uh, but before that, uh, I'm very pleased that we've got uh, Lisa Wills here. Um, and Lisa's going to tell us about, uh, you won't be aware of this, it's a verbal update, uh, something we've been talking about over the last two to three weeks. So not a formal report, but it's an information verbal update about the Community Crime Reduction Fund, which was um, started off as a paper back in February this year, and uh, Council Ashmore allocated £30,000 uh, over uh, three years. And uh, Lisa, if you'd like to go ahead and give the meeting an overview of what we've been doing, what the intention is, and when we can expect a formal paper. Sure, thanks very much. Um, the, um, the paper that the Community Crime Reduction Fund um, was approved in uh, the process to set up the Community Crime Reduction Fund was approved in uh, February this year. Um, there were two options considered. One was an application process um, inviting applications to the fund. Another was a community workshop approach. Uh, and the uh, councillors at the time uh, chose the community workshop approach. So what we've been doing since then is developing that idea and and finding out ways to, to do that. So it's, it's the approach is that it's, it's participatory budgeting in effect. So um, the plan at the moment is that we're, we're going out to get some quotes from people to run some good community workshops um, around, uh, to involve the community really in crime reduction. Um, we're at the, in the process of waiting for quotes to come back at the moment. 
um, and uh, we're hoping that the workshops will take place in the autumn. Um, I can give you some more detail about it if you'd like, but that's really the sum total of it. It's, it's a quick, it was a quick verbal update really just to, um, to make sure people were aware that it was happening. I think the, I, I have to correct you, my afraid, Councillor Hunt, that the amount of money that was set aside was um, £30,000 for, yeah. oh, for three years each year, £30,000, as opposed to um, 30000 over three years, sorry. So the total is 90000 it is. So, well, that's good news. So, the approach that I've agreed is that uh, we'll go out to the community to do. We, we we are evolving this right now, so it's not firmed up. So, there are three sectors in Portsmouth now, which is the north, central, and south. And we'll be looking to do community workshops to find community solutions to crime reduction. So, this is about the community. So the grassroots telling uh, its story and telling us about ways it feels that or they feel that crime can be uh, reduced and how it impacts on them. Any questions you'd like to ask? No, just a point, I guess, in future, if it's possible to have these things on the agenda so then we can kind of prepare accordingly. Well, I'm trying to be helpful. Um, it's a verbal update. You will get a paper, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to be open and transparent, so I'm bringing you the information as soon as I get it. So sometimes that won't be by way of a paper. If I think it's important, and it's something that would interest uh, yourselves, and I think it, it does, um, and it should, of course, and I know it will, uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring those by way of verbal reports, um, and you'll get subsequently a paper. Okay? But just if we could be advised of the fact that a verbal report's going to take place, Obviously, when you're aware. I mean, I've got, I've got no issue with this at all. It sounds like a brilliant report to have, but it may be another day something that I find more significant and I would have liked to have prepared for. So just a kind of... Not no, that's a very that. fair point, and I accept that. Thank you. Just to add, just a final thing to add about the, uh, the approach that we're taking. We want it to be, um, Councillor Hunt's very keen for this to be a cross-party piece of work. So um, I will be um, forwarding you the papers and, and the information in, uh, in due course. Thank you very much, Lisa. And you're free to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, uh, your report about uh, Portsmouth's food safety plan. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it is in confirmation the food safety operating plan 2019-2020. Um, I've written a very comprehensive covering report, um, which um, really is ahead of the actual plan, which is indeed very detailed itself. So, um, with your indulgence I will only um, go through some highlights of the front-facing report. The focus of the report is to define the profile of food businesses in Portsmouth and it sets out the very complex food safety functions which are delivered by Portsmouth City Council to ensure that the businesses that deliver food in Portsmouth are inspected in accordance with the government's requirements to ensure that public health is protected. It defines very precisely the manner in which those functions will be delivered over the next 12 months, and it is a requirement to deliver a food operating plan each year. The food oper operating plan will be considered in its entirety by the Food Standards Agency in due course, and I'll bring back to you any comments that they have to make in regard to the manner in which we deliver our functions in the next 12 months. And finally, the, the idea of the report is to set out how we have um, performed in the last 12 months. So there is a review of performance in a number of um, areas, which I will skim through very, very quickly indeed. A reminder that this is a statutory function to deliver this report, um, and that, of course, we need to comply with the Food Law Code of Practice, which is set by the government to the, in the manner in which we deliver these requirements. The service objectives are set out very precisely in Section 5 of the report, and very basically they are to enforce the legislation, but have a very ramped approach to enforcement. We are here not only as an enforcement agency, but primarily we wish to educate business about how they can protect the public when delivering food. 
All businesses must register with the Portsmouth City Council, with the regulatory services team, and upon registration they must comply with some basic standards in, in regard to how they handle, how they prepare, how they store, and how they manage their food preparation. And that is all set out within the report. The demand on the service remains high. We have around about 1,850 registered food businesses in the city, and we have obligations to routinely inspect those businesses. In the last 12 months, we inspected around about 900 food businesses, ranging from confectionery stores through to um, businesses that prepare and produce food. In terms of the rating of those businesses, there are a very high number which have achieved the highest rating of five and a very low number which have um, the lowest rating of zero and that is very clearly once again set out in, within the report. In terms of our enforcement, as I say, it's a very ramped approach to enforcement. It's about education and guiding business operators to ensure they know how to comply and maintain those standards throughout the, the duration that that business is open. In the report, it does set out a number of enforcement actions that we've taken, whether they be formal letters of warning, and there were around uh, 85 of those, whether they be formal notices requiring improvement, and there are around 30 of those we served this year. We've closed eight properties, and we've prosecuted seven properties for uh, major non-compliances of the law. Despite those numbers, and they might sound quite high, they represent only 1% of the food businesses in Portsmouth. So again, it's reiterating the high standard of food offer in Portsmouth. The key activities that we will deliver over the next 12 months are set out in section 14. Um, there are a number of key areas which we need to be concerned about, and that is the changes of legislation which are coming through the government. They are introducing a review of the manner in which we are required to deliver our processes. They call that regulating our future, and that is likely to be coming within this financial year. And of course, we can't um, ignore the fact that we'll be likely to removing the UK or parts of the UK from uh, the EU, and I suspect there will be some implications in terms of our ports and food import through the port and obviously the responsibilities for the food safety team are likely to increase as a result of that factor. Effectively our regime will continue in the next 12 months that it has been delivered uh, in the last few years. There are no major changes, um, however of course the manner in which we deliver our function has got to be um, brought to your attention and that is summarised within section 14, the key activities, and there's a lot more explanation within the food operating plan itself. Finally, it's worth noting the, the director's comments which are set out in uh, section 18, and that demonstrates the benefit of having a high food rating score. Those ratings are available for the public via a website, the Food Standards Agency. Every inspection that we, carried out, uh, we carry out is uploaded to that central government website. So anyone visiting any food business in Portsmouth can visit that website and consider the rating before they visit, or as they are visiting, or after they visited. Um, and of course they, they can find out information about the score and some further details about the business's performance in terms of food safety. Obviously businesses with the five rating may be con considered more appropriate for people to visit than businesses that have a zero rating. The rating score, to, to put it into a, a very uh, common language, is effectively an MOT when we visit the premises. If it has been closed by us for any particular reason, that does not necessarily mean that the premises needs to close forever. It has to improve, and it is quite possible for that premises to improve quickly and can reopen. The score, however, remains with that premises for a period of time. So if the public were to see a zero-rated premises on the FSA website, that does not necessarily mean that the premises can't open, just that the score, when we visited, was a low score. Likewise, high-performing premises, clearly that, that score will remain for the prem with that premises until we revisit again. There is earned recognition through this system. 
um, in regard to how quickly we re revisit premises. So a, a high scoring premises is likely not to be visited by us for a considerable period of time, maybe up to three years. So the benefit of having a, a, a high score is positive in terms of the public perception of that business and we won't visit that premises again until the routine inspection is due or until we get a complaint or concern about the premise brought to our attention from public that visit. So in conclusion, the re my recommendation is that um, the Cabinet member approves the food operating plan so that we can submit it onto the website. The FSA will review that plan in due course and the stats that are contained within and I'll bring any of their comments back to you in due course. Thank you. Any questions or comments um, from you guys? Just a quick comment. Um, thanks very much for the report. It's quite an informative insight into food safety and how that's regulated. I definitely learned a lot more from <laughs> reading the report than I knew about it before. Um, one of the things I had kind of previously picked up on was around the equality impact assessment. Um, obviously, because of the nature of food businesses in Portsmouth, there are particular groups that are kind of overrepresented, uh, particular minority groups that have a significant role in the sector. Um, so it's good to see that that's been now been reflected in the EIA, um, just to make clear kind of the steps obviously that we are taking to ensure that there aren't any kind of disproportionate or negative influences on those particular quality groups. Um, and just to kind of reassert again what I've said before around the EIAs, I do think that it's important that when they're done, they are done in kind of detail because I've got, been told kind of time and time again by different um, equalities groups and representatives from community groups that they sometimes feel that EIAs are kind of just tick box exercises. Um, so I do think it's really important, like this one, that they are kind of dealt with in detail and given the respect that they deserve. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Councillor you any, anything? Yeah, just to um, add that um, I'm, I'm happy with the report. It, it's really good. Yeah, it's... Okay, uh, yeah, thank you again for your uh, very detailed and comprehensive report. I think what it shows is that uh, this local authority takes, uh, through you, Mr Lee, and your food safety team, we're very grateful for all the work that you do, it shows this local authority takes the safety of um, uh, food very uh, seriously, like all other th local authorities, and um, uh, that we won't uh, risk people's health uh, and that's why uh, you go out and do what you do. And I think that's evidenced by the fact, although you say it's a minority of um, uh, premises, 1%, but we've closed eight uh, last year and prosecuted seven. So um, I think people can be sure, uh, feel sure that they're safeguarded when they go out to eat in our city, or indeed they buy things from shops, knowing that you and your team are there looking after our interests. So thank you all very much indeed. So yeah, I agree the report. Mr. Ma, who wanted to come and speak to your item, he, he's the officer that uh, you will be aware of. Uh, he's still not here at the moment. So do you mind if we take the item about community wardens <coughs> with Mrs. Hill? Would that be all right? Okay. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hill. Thank you. Um, this is an update on the provision of um, additional community wardens that were approved last year and began working um, at the council in April. Um, the council has four, eight full-time permanent community wardens um, and since April we've employed an additional eight community wardens who've been in post since early 2019 but they've only been uh, wholly operational since the 1st of April. Um, this team is funded from uh, environment, this additional team is funded from environment and community safety reserves, um, the flexible supported housing grant and the housing revenue account. Um, as this is a revenue cost, the reserve funding element can only be funded for one year. 
um, and the FSHG um, will also end in March 2020, um, although the housing element of funding is uh, can go beyond that. Um, the team works shifts from 8 till 2, um, Monday to Friday, and 9 to 2 at weekends, um, and this is in addition to the 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, shift that the uh, uh, um, permanent community warden team uh, cover. And they work every day except for Christmas Day, Boxing Day and New Year's Day. Um, and four of the additional eight replace the High Street Warden uh, project that we did um, uh, from early 2018 to early 2019. Um, the work includes all the work that community wardens do as well as some additional um, patrolling of local authority housing estates that began on the 1st of April, um, which is at evenings and weekends once the housing office teams have, have uh, finished for the day. Um, all of the community wardens work together as one team to help keep the city safe, clean and tidy and to provide support and advice when needed and it's a service which provides 120 hours of cover per week. They deal with a variety of demands from waste and fly tipping issues through to antisocial behaviour, rough sleeping and unauthorised encampments. And there's two permanent community warden managers managing that service. Uh, they carry out targeted patrols across the city and on housing estates based on demands that they receive as well as ongoing issues and they're part of the neighbourhoods team and work closely with the waste management and environmental enforcement teams as well as the housing options, area housing office, environmental health, parks and parking teams. Additionally they work with other agencies such as the police, um, um, Society of St James and other outreach services to resolve issues together. And the team provides support and advice to try and resolve issues um, and on occasion they may also take enforcement action where necessary. Since the introduction of the additional eight community warden posts, demand dealt with has increased substantially, which you can see in Appendix A. Um, a demand comes from reports that members of the public make as well as that which is seen when on patrol um, by the team. And the team use the information and data that they gather to understand where to place their resources most effectively. Uh, the demand has increased because the size of the team has increased and also because we we're doing these additional patrols in the housing blocks which were, there was a similar sort of thing going on, slightly different um, prior to that with a security team. Um, some things that are worth noting is that about two-thirds of the demands that they deal with are picked up when they're out proactively patrolling or attending to instances where the demands have been reported. 24% um, of the jobs that they um, interact with are passed to other departments, so they're reporting things to the highways PFI team, our recycling and refuse teams, housing offices, etc., as well as um, passing things and working with external agencies such as the police. Um, the extended hours have enabled the team to direct resources to issues that were previously difficult to monitor, particularly in our housing blocks and in other places in the city, because we've got longer hours which we can flex. Um, so although the team is set to work till two in the morning, uh, there's been a few occasions where we found things going on. We know they're going on after that, so we've started them later to try and um, deal with those things. In about a quarter of the cases, the team find that on attendance to a reported incident or targeted patrol that the area is clear, and they, the data is continue an, continually an, analysed, um, and we will adjust the targeted patrols to make sure we're making the best use of our resources. Um, it's worth noting that 86.1% um, of the reported demand is responded to on the same day, with a further 11% being responded to the next day, so they are quite a responsive team also. The purpose of the report and the update really is to um, just make you aware that the cost of continuing to provide the additional community warden team will be about £312,000 a year. Um, and based on the nature of the work, the funding would need to be a combination of housing revenue account and general fund or grant funding because they're working across housing areas but equally across other areas of the city. Um, the team's already been able to demonstrate an impact in terms of the volumes of work that they're able to respond to, the volumes of work that they're able to resolve, um, and further funding is needed to secure this cover going forward. Um, if the team is not able to continue this, it means we'll have less capacity to deal with the demands. 
Um, and currently, every community warden in the team is um, deals with an average of just over a thousand demands per year. So that you know, for every community warden we can't fund, that's a thousand things we won't be able to attend or deal with. Um, and that's it, really. Um, I, I do intend to bring you a further report um, around October time, because uh, the work I'm doing at the moment is to identify funding. Um, we're just in the budget setting process, as you'll be aware. And um, so we're doing everything we can to try and identify and, and plug that um, budget pressure. OK, so <clears throat> the reason I wanted this report uh, to come forward was as you uh, identified in the uh, in the informal meeting that we had uh, a couple of weeks back is um, getting my uh, um, th this particular service in there right in front of the full council everybody so they understand that uh, we need to fund these uh, wardens going forward and so the budget setting process has just begun uh, this is my stab at uh, making sure that the community wardens know that we're fighting for them to make sure the service remains as is right now and that is my attention within the cabinet and the cabinet have given me every indication so far that that is going to continue so and it also uh, gives us the opportunity to look at what the community wardens are doing particularly in light of recent events around our parks and in particular the uh, incident, the outbreak of disorder at the Hot Walls recently, which the community wardens attended. So I'd like to thank all of them and all of your staff, Mrs Hill, for what they do for us, and including the CCTV staff, and I presume you're going to do that report uh, yeah, next, I take it. That. So we'd like to thank all of them, because the weather's been very hot, there have been a lot of hot heads out there, and they've coped uh, magnific magnificently working across the service with the police, fire, ambulance, everybody. So um, uh, all of our uh, thanks on behalf of the council to all the emergency services and indeed the um, community warden service and CCTV and everybody who does that role uh, and, and all the people that support them across the council. Uh, uh, guys, anything you would like to add in any way? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Corkery. Um, so I guess just really to kind of echo what you said about the importance of the service and the kind of regular feedback that I get from my constituents is how much they value seeing um, the community wardens in their blocks and on their estates, particularly out of hours uh, where previously they may have felt there was a bit of a, a gap in service and also not just in terms of kind of uh, responding to particular issues and patrolling uh, but I've also come across them a number of times at different community events mm -hmm. and meetings um, so I think that's another really important aspect and you kind of talked about that's the way in which they pick up issues and mm -hmm. almost the, kind of the, the eyes and ears of the council out there in the communities that really need our support um, and I guess yeah to kind of pick up on the issue around funding I think this is something that we definitely like to support and hopefully be able to, like you said, um, council hunt work across councils to try and secure the long-term um, security of this scheme. Particular, obviously, it's important to have the scheme running, but I also think about it from a staffing perspective, um, having people on fixed-term contracts, kind of year to year, with little awareness of whether that's going to go on any further. Obviously, it isn't really giving our staff the security they deserve, and they need to kind of build settled lives. Um, so hopefully, that's something we can try and build on having long-term permanent positions made available as well. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for raising that point, and we discussed this uh, with Mrs. Hill and her team. Uh, that remains the aspiration uh, of the um, of the cabinet and the uh, administration, um, and we must see how the budgets uh, lie. Uh, and indeed, we'll be looking to do that. Uh, on top of, of course, what the community wardens do, working across the portfolio, we've also brought in five hundred thousand pounds worth of um, youth support work and community action network and motivate. Uh, so I work with the community wardens. So this is a one big team effort right across the city and indeed with ports within the community and a whole range of other um, uh, volunteers and, and groups across the city. I'll just ask on that on the extended youth provision because I've heard it referred to um, a lot of times but I've never actually seen any detail. Is there kind of detailed information available about what that will consist of yet or is it still being 
work through? Well, it's, up and, it's currently up and running, uh, but you're right, uh, uh, they're attending events right now, so it was a, when we were at Buckland they were there, so that is, I understand there's some uh, I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed before the contract, and it may well have been signed recently, I don't know, that's not within my purview at the moment, but I think the I's needed to be dotted and the T's needed to be crossed, but they are there and they, and they are doing good work already. Whose remit does it come under? So uh, that's a uh, I think that's in Rob Woods. Um, I think that's in Rob Woods' um, portfolio of services. But I can check it out for you. Thanks. If you drop me an email, uh, I'll make sure it gets to the right place. Gemma, <coughs> Miss New. And I think um, new to that. Just uh, I entirely agree with both yourself and Councillor Corkery in this. And um, yeah, we should support this and have it continued definitely. Yeah, I'm sure you will take back all of our thanks to all of the teams. Thank you. So we'll move on then to um, CCTV in the hope that Mr. Ma shows up quite soon. Um, uh, no need to pad it out because uh, <laughs> otherwise we'll take the report as it is anyway. So, and the report's by my colleague, uh, Roy Goulding, who couldn't be here today. He's the community safety manager and directly manages the CCTV team. This again is an information only item and just to provide the cabinet member for community safety with an update of the CCTV camera system that's been installed um, at Stampshaw Adventure Playground, uh, which covers um, part of Stampshaw Park. Um, the background to this is that we did carry out a review of the CCTV cameras at Stampshaw Park following a police officer being uh, stabbed on the 21st of February close to the Adventure Playground. Um, but there have also been reports of antisocial behaviour occurring in the area. Um, in the <coughs> short term, we put a redeployable camera was installed whilst we looked at works to upgrade the system in the park. Um, Hampshire Constabulary has identified Stampshaw Park as a priority for them due to these incidents taking place and requested support for the installation of CCTV cameras. There is already a bespoke CCTV system installed at Stampshaw Adventure Playground with a capacity to view and record images with eight CCTV cameras operational on that site. Um, four additional cameras are to be installed in the playground pending the installation of a permanent power supply um, on two lamp posts. There are five cameras installed on the youth centre main building which cover the, the playground site and the park area to the east of the park. Um, and three cameras are installed on a north side of floodlight within the external ball court area and this covers the ballpark and some of the park area to the east and west. These are p permanent cameras that form part of the 12 camera Stamshaw system. Um, the redeployable camera, which is at one unit that contains three different cameras, um, is installed on a south side floodlight within the external ball court area. Um, these cameras are operational, the redeployables, um, but they can be they're operational at Stampshaw at the moment, but they can be relocated to a different position in the city if required, so that's not a permanent installation. Uh, the redeployable was a immediate response to ensure CCTV coverage in the park was installed as soon as possible whilst we um, carried out the works to improve the uh, permanent solutions. Um, and a second redeployable has been installed on a camera, sorry, on a lamppost in Ranley Road covering the entrance to the car park near Stumpshaw Angling Club. Um, Roy Goulding and the CCTV team have been liaising with the police um, and this continues to be, you know, it, when we wrote the report it was a priority and it continues to be a priority for the police in terms of community safety. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just remind members, there is a case about to undergo, <coughs> somebody's been arrested, so we must be a little bit careful about what we say, but uh, um, uh, it's good news that uh, all these cameras, is already being reported in the news on um, July the 24th. It was one of the first things I uh, set out to um, do when we um, when, when this uh, particular matter happened. People were saying that all the cameras were taken away. That wasn't quite true. Uh, that would become obvious in due course. Um, and But this is good news. Residents up there are very pleased um, that they'll be able to go in there. Uh, and the, the park is virtually covered uh, so far as it can be completely apart from the tree cover and there are um, places under some of the trees that you just can't look at but apart from that the entrance is going in and going out 
people can feel much better and can feel better safeguarded by the um, installation of the cameras uh, at this location. Okay, um, Councillor Corkery, would you like to add anything or yeah. ask any questions? I just want to say um, I, th I do think this is a good idea if it's going to help improve antisocial behaviour, crime, um, but also boost safety there as well. It's it's really good, and um, but it's probably something that we could look at maybe in other areas as well um, for, for that kind of thing because we have got not so much the seriousness of the incident that's happened, but. Um, antisocial behaviour, maybe some low level um, graffiti or criminal damage as such as in other, I mean in Paulsgrove I know there's some, um, uh, yeah maybe it's something we could discuss for other areas as well to, if, if it's helping in, in an area like this then I can't see why it couldn't help, I mean maybe not as many cameras or anything but maybe a bit more low-key but um, what I could do is get Roy to update you on what provision there is already in the Pools Grove area and then we can look at where we're having any issues um, and talk to you about that is that okay that'd be yeah. brilliant thank you hi Miss Ma yeah you're quite right um, I just come in there so we there was a uh, ongoing um, um, problems I remember along Alloway Avenue about 18 months ago when some of the local councillors got really involved, um, perhaps you're one of them, I don't remember, but certainly in the news, and said so they were very proactive in getting um, um, more resources directed to that location. Yeah. We, we, had, um, we had, like, um, we've got outside the shops along Alloway Avenue, there's railings and there's like planters set on top. The kids pulled all of that out, destroyed the whole lot. Um, but at the same time taunting people visiting the shops as well um, and that was all around like the youth club up there because they were barred from there because of various issues so it, rather than helping the situation they just dispersed it from one place to another so um, it was so yeah something could be useful I guess up there indeed so the call on these resources is really quite uh, enormous obviously and 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 as I'll be reminded shortly too I think that uh, they we need to be proportionate in how we respond to these things and and taking into account the resources but I can assure you that Mr Golding who runs these things he's looking at how and at my request looking at how to expand uh, cameras and obviously technology becomes cheaper over time um, and indeed it improves over time so as the cost of these things comes down hopefully we will be able to do more but at this, the other thing I'll throw in here too is the £500,000 we, sp we spent on the uh, on the youth let's call it outreach work uh, in order to make sure kids uh, are have something to do uh, across the summer months in particular um, would you like to add anything uh, Councillor Corkery? Yeah um, so I definitely recognise the role, the positive role that CCTV can play in the kind of deterrence and detection of um, crime and also trying to put off um, people from participating in, in antisocial behaviour and it's definitely got an important role to play. Um, but I, I guess I want to balance that by raising the issue around um, human rights and privacy and asking the question of are we sure that this is proportionate um, and have, has there really been a kind of detailed investigation into the privacy aspect, into whether it is proportionate um, as required by the kind of national legislation set out around the use of CCTV? You talked about there will be almost 100% coverage of the park, uh, barring areas where it's just kind of technically impossible to cover. That really kind of raises a bit of a, a red flag for me around the proportionality of this. And I know the kind of report doesn't make any reference to uh, proportionality, which is one of the key principles of the uh, National Surveillance Camera Code of Conduct. And I know that we've got our own code of conduct, which kind of replicates that down at the local level. Um, I also note that our code of conduct with relation to um, surveillance camera use um, has provision for an annual report where the current provision of CCTV is reviewed. Um, so I just wanted to ask really 
where those annual reports are and if they're being done, because I couldn't find any kind of mentions of them online. Um, and just lastly, a point around, you talked about, um, Council Hunt, your intentional wish to further expand CCTV provision across the city. Um, and it, again, I recognise there will be places where that is appropriate and necessary, and there is certainly, among certain groups and people, a demand for that. I've been contacted by constituents requesting CCTV be installed in their block or their area to tackle issues. Um, but I think there's potentially a wider public discussion to be had around the kind of issues I've raised around proportionality and privacy. Um, so maybe cause some consideration should be given to a wider public consultation over whether the people of Portsmouth wish to have more of their communities covered by CCTV or not. Yeah, you're right. It is very much an, uh, an important point. I thank you for raising it. And so long as I sit here, every time I make a decision about such things, uh, I will look at the uh, need and whether or not it is proportionate. I, I very gently and kindly point out to you that if you go along Estella Road Flats or Grafton Street Flats, if you go up in the lift, you're on CCTV. If you come out onto all of the uh, walkways, you're on CCTV. And when I've gone along there and spoken to residents, uh, and indeed around Nickleby House and so on, uh, they are all, I've never heard anybody say they want any less CCTV, I've only ever heard a request for uh, more CCTV or why isn't my um, front door covered. But you are completely fair to bring up this uh, point and as a Liberal it's something that sits in my mind all the time. Nevertheless where the, uh, I think that the uh, 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 these cameras reduce the harm and reduce crime to people and give them more freedom to do what they want to do and to be free from the fear of crime it's very important uh, part of the service but I will always be proportionate I assure you and if I think we're overdoing anything um, I will step in uh, but I don't I really don't think all I hear is uh, from the vast majority of people is please can we have more CC um, TV coverage and that, of course, is a pressure for us too. We hear about the re redeployable cameras. People are always asking them for in their area, so we hear that the redeployable camera may at some time be indeed redeployed. So um, CCTV is part of our life nowadays, and uh, uh, people uh, very much uh, like it. Okay, thank you very much indeed for the report. Um, I've taken on board what Ms. Uh, uh, Councillor Cal Corkery said about the annual report. Can you email him and let him know we can find the information and whether or not that report will come? Yeah, um, I know that they, we do review the cameras annually and sometimes more, more frequently if they're a particular instance and we're trying to ensure that we've got the right coverage in the city. Um, and we do apply proportionate proportionality I mean the number of requests we get to put our redeployable cameras in places for a one-off instant um, and we sort of say well we've only got a record of one instant so there is a proportionality test applied but I'll, I'll get Roy to um, brief you on that in a bit more detail um, as far as the report I'm not aware that there's an actual report but I'll check with Roy and come back to you on that yeah thank you for that uh, good afternoon uh, Mr. Ma uh, do you want to come up here sir it's all right Yes. So, I'm dreadfully sorry to keep you waiting, but it's a very important um, report about the partnership working that we're doing uh, around independent sexual violence advocate funding. And if you guys would like to come up, I presume you come here to speak to the item, is that correct? Yes. Please do. So in front, have you spoken at these meetings before, or any of them? So you know, you know which button to press, as it were. Okay. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and say who you are and where you're from? Um, yeah, my name's Kirsty Meller. Um, I live in Charles Dickens Ward, and I'm a community activist. Do I start now? Sorry. Oh, sorry. So you've got. I think you've got six minutes, hasn't you? You've got six minutes. So it's your. It's three and a half. It's very so, well, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much indeed. Okay, sexual violence is any unwanted sexual act or activity, including but not restricted to rape, sexual assault, child sexual abuse, sexual harassment, rape within marriage or relationships, trafficking, sexual exploitation and ritual abuse. 
Sexual violence can be committed by someone known to us and even trusted to us, such as a friend, colleague, family member, partner or ex-partner, as well as by strangers and acquaintances. Sexual violence can happen regardless of age, class, disability or gender. It can happen to anyone. An independent sexual violence advisor provides a service to victims and survivors of rape and sexual assault. The independent sexual violence advisor role was commissioned by Baroness Stern through the Home Office Violent Crime Unit in 2005. Funding to women's services has suffered catastrophic cuts since the Tory Lib Dem coalition in 2010. Nearly 40% of sexual offences across Hampshire are domestic related, increasing to 50% of rapes in Portsmouth. Portsmouth City Council has cut funding for IDVAs and ISVAs in the city and also to refuge provision. Why, when these services potentially save victims' lives? Community Safety was once home to the Early Intervention Project, a valuable service in our city that worked with and supported survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence. It was well staffed and well funded. Sadly, that service has experienced harsh cuts. Although a service still exists, the number of IDVAs and ISVAs has dramatically reduced. Thankfully, we still have other provisions in the city that provide these much-needed services, particularly Aurora New Dawn, a charity started by a group of women who had expertise in the area of domestic abuse and sexual violence. But like every other service that has been affected by cuts, these providers are struggling. Struggling to obtain the necessary funding they need to provide a service that can reach out to all victims in our city. It's incredibly worrying that vital funding for women's services is cut. This puts victims and survivors at great risk and leaves them vulnerable to further abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder and long-term physical and mental illness. About 15 years ago, I needed support from an IDVA and ISVA. That support lasted for nearly seven years when finally I was empowered enough to leave my abusive partner. Domestic abuse and sexual violence isn't as simple as why doesn't she just leave or she was drunk or did you see the way she was dressed? She, d she was asking for it. It's incredibly complex and difficult and quite often extremely hard to admit that you are a victim of abuse. Without that support, I may not be standing here today as a strong woman I am. From the moment I disclosed the abuse, I was treated with dignity and respect. I was believed and no longer suffering in silence. I was empowered to make choices that supported and protected me and my children. I'm urging cabinet members to give their approval and for community safety to commit £10,000 to a year's extension to the jointly commissioned Hampshire and Portsmouth Independent Sexual Violence Advisor Service. This service is vital in our city and vital in supporting victims of sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Mr. Ma what I'll do, Kirsty, if you wait there, Mr. Mellor here, uh, Mr. Ma here, sorry, he's going to, he, he'll give the report. And I'm very happy if you want to stay there, you ask him a couple of questions if you like afterwards. Is that all right? Maybe. Okay. Mr. Marr. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. I think um, Kirsty summarised the role um, far better than I. Um, uh, uh, far better than I have in one paragraph. The current provision which has been commissioned just over two years ago is due to expire at the end of March. Um, they have done a superb job. Um, it was the first jointly commissioned ISVA provision across Hampshire and Portsmouth. Prior to that, um, there was provision in Portsmouth, there was none in Hampshire. So it is a new direction we're going in relation to commissioning sexual violence services. Um, demand has been high um, and, that has, and there's been added pressures as a result of the increasing public profile of historical sexual abuse. Um, so much of their work has become more complex because some is recent and current abuse and others is about so supporting victims who have uh, experienced abuse from um, years previously. Um, what we're requesting is £10,000 to um, extend the contract from April 2020 to March 2021. Um, it's currently delivered as lead partner by Yellow Door 
uh, yellow dawn, a yellow door, sorry, but subcontracted to a raw new dawn for this area of the uh, of Hampshire and Portsmouth. Um, and from a local authority perspective, explore um, ongoing funding from cash limit to extend the contract further from April 2021. Kelly, any questions you'd like to ask him about that at all? Yeah. Okay. So the, the truth is, um, I did have to bring the report here. I could have just signed the money over, but I want this out in the open. I want people to be able to come here and talk about these um, issues, and I'm very glad that you have. Uh, I can't control the reductions in national spending by whomever. Uh, what I can do is to try and work cross services and cross portfolio and with um, Aurora New Dawn and uh, uh, all sorts of other partners across the city to try and uh, reduce um, and prevent uh, these sexual crimes. Um, it's not how we respond to them as well. It's how we treat our young people in our city because it's everybody grows up and uh, funding for young people has reduced over the years as well so there are many um, children who are badly treated at home as you say within the family and we see them uh, growing up and things happen that we would otherwise not want to happen and I include in that things about suicide so suicide I'm not changing shifting and changing the debate here it's all part of the same thing um, people who are badly treated uh, at home by relatives, partners, families, is a very difficult matter. Uh, children at home raped by their own fathers and uh, and badly treated. We, we know this. So I want it out in the open so we can talk about it. So um, I'll be very pleased to uh, sign the, um, uh, the financial agreement presently. Um, Councillors, Councillor New, would you like to say or start off with anything? No, I agree, and I think this service should continue with the extension. Councillor Corkery. Um, so, thank you, Councillor Hunt, for, like you say, it's not necessarily a report that has to be bought, but if it's obviously in the public interest to have these issues aired, give members of the public the opportunity to engage in them and kind of spread awareness of what's going on. Um, I think that's quite a sensible approach to take as a cabinet holder, cabinet portfolio holder, um, and maybe you could speak to some of your colleagues about doing a similar kind of thing. <laughs> it would be helpful. Um, in terms of this particular contract, what, one of the first things I did after being elected a few months ago is visited Aurora New Dawn in Portsmouth to get a better understanding of kind of who they are and the services they provide. And I was really impressed by the kind of the breadth of services they offer. They're clearly um, very dedicated to the, the cause, um, and also quite a kind of it struck me as quite a dynamic and values-led organisation, um, which is quite refreshing these days, particularly in the, the kind of charity sector. You're seeing more and more of a trend towards kind of bland and corporate organisations. So it's nice to see a bit of a change from that. In terms of the future funding. Um, it's talked about there's going to be a retender um, of a further three years, April 21, 21 to March 24. Is the expectation that PCC will continue to kind of jointly commission that along with the, alongside the existing arrangement? Yes, Councillor Hunt. The uh, current uh, contract is led by Hampshire County Council um, in partnership with the Office of the Police Crime Commissioner and Portsmouth City Council, and all three parties are. Uh, showing an ongoing commitment. Indeed, and we hope so, because you've only got to look at the statistics within the report to see uh, how, excuse, for want of a better word, what value for money that the uh, people at Portsmouth gets out of this um, partnership. It is good value for money, there's no question about that. I, I would say too that um, as we go on throughout over the years, I mean, the City Council is more and more commissioning services, whether anyone likes it or not, because that's the way uh, local government is going. Uh, whether or not uh, we start to deliver these sorts of services directly um, depends on whether or not um, uh, national government changes its direction of travel um, under successive uh, administrations across many, many years. Uh, funding for local government has reduced. 
doesn't matter who was running the country, uh, the, the funding for local government has reduced. All these MPs say they love local government. When it comes to it, they don't, uh, they don't fund it very well at all, uh, or not as well as they should. So it is a, it's a, it's a big problem for whoever is running the city. Um, anything else anybody would like to add? So what I'll be doing next is then signing that uh, agreement, the financial paper, and then that money will be released to the partnership. I believe that's right. Okay, well, thanks. I think that concludes the meeting today. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming, Kirsty. Thank you. And thank you, councillors, for coming along too. And thank you to the news for attending today as well. Uh, thanks, for, thanks a lot, Mr. Marr.